From organizing and participating in demonstrations to providing support and leadership behind the scenes, women played a crucial role in the civil rights movement, even though their contributions are often overlooked or undervalued. The rest of the story coming up. This is KRT, Critical Race Theory. It's not the one they teach in law school, but the one banned in public schools. The contributions of women in the civil rights movement are often overlooked as they are overshadowed by the more recognized and celebrated role of men. Despite facing gender discrimination and sexual harassment within the movement, many women played crucial roles. That included leading local organizations and serving as lawyers in segregation lawsuits. One of these women was Gwendolyn Zahara Simmons. She was a member of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and a field director for the Mississippi Freedom Summer Project. She recounts challenges she faced as a woman in a leadership role. She had to fight for resources and respect and dealt with instances of sexual harassment among her colleagues. Lonnie King, an activist with SNCC in Atlanta, speaks highly of Diane Nash, a leader of the Nashville movement who was overlooked due to sexism. He says she was articulate, a beautiful woman, very photogenic, very committed, very intelligent, and had a following. However, James Bevel, Marion Berry, and John Lewis leapfrogged over her. Ikwome Michael Thuo, a leader of the Nonviolent Action Group and a student at Howard University, reflects on the sacrifices that women made in joining the struggle, including their social standing and opportunities. There was Mildred Bond Roxborough, born in Brownsville, Tennessee. She was a longtime secretary of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. There, she organized meetings and held key positions and programs. She hailed from a family with a rich tradition of African-American empowerment. Her mother's family founded Toilette, Arkansas after the Reconstruction Era. It was an all-African-American town and her parents chartered the first chapter of the NAACP in Brownsville, Tennessee. Another SNCC activist was Dory Adelaide Derby. She remembers that young women activists learned resourcefulness and drive through the challenges of the freedom struggle. During her time with SNCC, Derby worked as a photographer and educator and a grassroots organizer. By the end of the movement, she amassed thousands of negatives documenting daily life in the Mississippi Delta region, many focusing on black women. There was also a teenager. Ruby Nail Sales is a nationally recognized human rights activist, public theologian, and social critic. Her articles and work appear in many journals, online sites, and books. She joined SNCC in the 1960s as a teenager at Tuskegee University and went to work as a student freedom fighter in Lowndes County, Alabama. In August 1965, Sales, along with other SNCC workers, joined young people from Fort Deposit, Alabama, who organized a demonstration to protest the actions of the local white grocery store owners who had cheated their parents. The group was arrested and held in jail and then suddenly released. And then Jonathan Daniels, a white seminarian, was assassinated right before he pulled sales out of the line of fire when they attempted to enter a cash grocery store to buy sodas. The store owner, Tom Coleman, also shot and deeply wounded Father Richard Morris Rowe, a Chicago priest. Despite threats of violence, Sales was determined to attend the trial of Daniel's murderer, Tom Coleman, and to testify on behalf of her slain colleague. As usual in these cases, Coleman was acquitted by an all-white jury. Sales also encourages us to look beyond the simplistic story of Rosa Parks refusing to move to the back of the bus in Montgomery. As she explains, Parks was a longtime activist who had sought justice for African-American women who were frequently assaulted, both verbally and physically, in their daily lives. When we look at Rosa Parks, she did that because of her civil rights and wanting to sit down on the bus. 
but it also was a rebellion of maids, a rebellion of working class women who were tired of boarding the buses in Montgomery and being assaulted and called out of their names and abused by white bus drivers. And that's why that movement could hold so long. If it had been merely a protest about riding the bus, it might have shattered, but it went to the very heart of black womanhood and black women played a major role in sustaining that movement. Other women in the movement include Leah Chase. She was a celebrated chef and community leader from New Orleans who helped to bring about change simply by doing what she does best, bringing people together over good food and providing an atmosphere of warmth and caring. During the Civil Rights Movement, she hosted Martin Luther King Jr., Thurgood Marshall, members of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and many others of all races and backgrounds at her family restaurant, Dookie Chase. There was also Eileen Hernandez. She began her activism as a student leader at Howard University during World War II in then legally segregated Washington, D.C. In 1964, she became the first woman and the first African-American to be appointed to the Equal Opportunity Commission, from which she resigned because of its unwillingness to address sexual harassment. Next, Kathleen Cleaver. Her activism was inspired by her parents and their circle of friends and colleagues in Tuskegee, Alabama, where service and fighting for one's rights were expected. She was the first woman to serve on the Central Committee of the Black Panther Party, where she developed communication strategies and outreach to the media. She and her then husband, Eldridge Cleaver spent four years in exile from the United States in Algeria and Korea, where their children were born. Kathleen Cleaver returned to the United States in 1973 with her husband and created the Revolutionary People's Communications Network. She later graduated from Yale University, summa cum laude, and went on to the Yale University, graduating in 1989. She clerked for federal judge A. Leon Higginbotham, and became a law professor. And then there was Merle Evers. Most of Americans watching her deliver the invocation at the second inauguration of President Obama in 2013 would likely be surprised to know of her heroic history. As the wife of Medgar Evers, Mississippi's first NAACP field secretary, she knew the dangers of activism for racial equality. She and her husband were partners in every way. Their home was firebombed and Medgar was assassinated in their driveway. Maintaining her commitment to civil rights and public service, she waged an unsuccessful campaign for Congress and later became the first black woman to serve on the Los Angeles Board of Public Works. At the age of 62, she became the chair of the NAACP and helped to reinvigorate the organization. Meanwhile, she pursued justice for the assassination of her husband it was a three-decade commitment that ended in 1994 when the killer, an avowed white supremacist, was convicted of murder. These experiences and memories highlight the crucial and often unsung contributions of women in the civil rights movement. This has been Critical Race Theory. Please like and subscribe and share this video with your friends and family. I'll see you next time.